if I could change anything, it definitely, I would have definitely prepared more for the trauma of being black and successful. He introduces us to Lamar Odom. Well, my name is Harleen Flowers. Um, born in D.C. I wish I could say I was raised there, but um, it wouldn't be honest. Spent more time in prison um, than in society, so definitely where I was born and raised in my formidable childhood years. 100%. Being from Washington, D.C., can you describe, you know, like the area you grew up in and mm -hmm. kind of give us like, you know, insight on what your childhood was like for the time that you did? Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful thing to be able to look back on it now, you know, to see all of the elements of being born in 1980 and the election of Reagan. You know, when you're born, you don't have no understanding of that, but Reagan elected in 1980 and you had the Reaganomics and the introduction of crack cocaine um, in the 80s, Oliver North situation, the CIA, the whole Iran-Contra scandal or whatever, but, you know, just crack cocaine, Reaganomics, um, D.C. being Chocolate City in the sense that the population was majority black um, but extremely poor and you know, with poverty and this introduction to this new narcotic, this crack cocaine thing, um, came an opportunity to make, make a lot of money, but also what came with it was the gun violence and, you know, the prisons and, you know, the mass incarceration. So for me, um, growing up in D.C., I could see, like, how it made me limited. You know, it wasn't until I went to the feds later on in life that I grew to appreciate diversity. And, and saw the limited nature of just like growing up in an impoverished city that just had one ethnic look, you know. And um, but it, it was it was it was definitely uh, the murder capital uh, from the '91 on up, and in, of any city in America. And then it also had the highest incarceration rate of any city in the world for like 20 years. So. Just dealing with that, you know, that pocket of poverty, drug, alcohol abuse, gun violence, mass incarceration. For sure, for sure. So from the time, you know, because I know you, you know, the beginning of your incarceration started early for you, you know. Um, just that window before, you know, your incarceration initially happened, can you describe, like, what the streets was like when during that time of being a murder cop? What, what was it just like? What was the environment like? For me, like, I did, I had the opportunity to move to Chesapeake, Virginia Beach when I was like four and five. So I came back to D.C. in 86 when I was six. And this was when I recognized that my dad was on crack. I didn't recognize it when I was in Virginia. But being back in D.C., hearing the gunshots, um, cause I really had like a traumatic free life up, up until that point. So just realizing what my dad was going through. And then like in 91, when DC became the murder capital, it was, you used to see city under siege, but it wasn't tangible to me. But then in 92, when, um, my childhood hero or person who I looked up to, he, um, he was murdered. He was 16. And that was my first time really like just being introduced personally to the violence. And then from that point, he got killed. A week later, somebody killed somebody, you know. And just from that point, just the violence just became a part of my, my everyday reality. For sure. For sure. Um, so like during that time, you know, because uh, just, you know, I stated in your book, um, it was a lot of series of events that took place, you know, just in your dealings in the street, mm -hmm. you know, before, you know, you even, you know, got, got incarcerated. Like, what was one of your first early lessons, you know, during that time when you were going through these things? Like, what was one of the first things that the streets taught you? Um, one of the things 
and that's this is it's so strange because like right now I'm wearing some sneakers I design, right? And oftentimes when I tell my story, people have this narrative of, oh, you went to prison illiterate and then you became Muslim in prison. You know what I'm saying? So for me, I took my pre-SATs when I was 11. I was taking classes at Howard University when I was 11. Um, I started selling drugs when I was 12 because I wanted sneakers, right? And, and what I learned, and I don't think that I could articulate it back then as I could now, but what I learned in life was that um, when you let people control your value, how you see yourself, then you will do anything to be accepted, even destroy your own life, just to be accepted by other people. So for me, like, I didn't have to sell drugs. I mean, my family wasn't rich, but we wasn't poor, poor. But I felt like if I didn't have those shoes or those clothes, then I couldn't be that guy because nobody cared that I was smart. Nobody cared that I was taking summer classes at Howard. That, that wasn't relevant to my peers in my impoverished community, right? So what I did was, and I always explain to people, like I went to prison when I was 12 because that's when I started putting the, 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 the handcuffs on who I really was as Harleen Flowers and started to become this image, you know, of what I thought would be celebrated and praised by people in my community. So that was my first lesson. For sure. How did you, um, how did you get the nickname Face? Wow. Um, my friend Kareem, uh, we used to, Joan, right? I'm trying to say a word that's universal because I know people all over the world gonna watch this. So we used to joke yeah. on one another. And I always was like a, a very good comedian. And, um, you know, I was joking with him about him and how he looked. And he's just like, hold up, man. He put his like hands up to my face. Like, man, you got a, you got a little face, man. I'm gonna start calling you little face. And that's how I got the name Face. For sure, for sure. Um, knowing who you are today is Haleen mm -hmm. Flowers, or who you been. But, like, what's the difference between Haleen and Face? Face, Face is, because I'm st st still a part of me. Um, face is a child, right? Um, living in a prison of being accepted by people's opinions and that varies by the trends of whatever the culture finds to be in vogue at the time. Um, he faces, he is, um, he's emotionless. He's always intoxicated. Um, not knowing at the time that the lifestyle that he's living, you know, when you live in a lifestyle of harming yourself and others, understanding that the consequences that come with it is death or prison for life. And you keep in mind, we're talking about a child. We're not talking about a, somebody that went to the boot camp training and be, you know, been desensitized to war. We're talking about a child. So facing someone who's, just, he's, He's a very good actor. Like I say, he's a comedian. He's an artist. You know, he's a rapper. He can play roles, and he 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 plays this role. It, 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 and it's versatile. It can be a drug dealer. It can be a comedian. It could be a stick up boy. It could be a, it could be a gambler. It could be a murderer. Um, it can be a lifer. It could be a convict, right? So he just he's playing these roles. Whereas those Harleen, the person that was who was before face and after face, Harlem is just like, he's the artist. He's the, he's the, he's the genius. Sure. You know, he's the genius. So by him being the genius, he's the guy that bust the pre-SATs wide open. You know, that the colleges won him when he was a kid and even today as a 41-year-old man, um, the genius is just in him being him and, and being him fearlessly. So that's the difference. Like, face is a character. For sure. 
and Halim is the reality. For sure. Um, I know that, um, like, during the Reagan era, you know, which, you know, was before me being born. Um, damn, it, before you a, being born? Yeah, I was, I was born in 94. God damn. So, yeah, it's not you. Um, that it's a lot of conversation on, you know, how certain guns and drugs will be placed in certain neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people, that sounds like a myth. Mm -hmm. um, if you have experienced that, which you know, I know in your book you you detailed a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of walk us through that, like being a in, a in a more realistic sense? Like, was that a real thing? For me, right? Because right now, you know, they say art imitates life, and life imitates art. And we know in real life we have a guy named Rick Ross, right? right. Not the rapper, right. the real person. Yeah. And um, he has a narrative, right? And he's sharing his narrative. And right now, we have one of the most uh, popular TV series called Snowfall. My show right there. Right? Watch it every week. I think it's based loosely on his life, right? So now, that's Rick Ross' experience. My experience, is all I know is that every night, not every night, but a few nights a week, because I used to sell drugs on the graveyard shift, you know, past midnight, and you had these white guys would pop up. They say they were from West Virginia, right? And they would buy drugs, crack cocaine for money, and then sometimes they would have guns. Like, hey, you know, I got a such and such, Mini 14, you know. But I noticed, like, I started selling drugs in 93. I started resolving my conflicts through gun violence in 95. And I noticed that they started coming to me in 95. Was that coincidentally? Was that orchestrated? I don't know. But I do know I'm living in Washington, D.C. We have the headquarters of the FBI. We have the headquarters of the CIA in Langley. And... We had a narrative that I wasn't aware of that was birthed in November 95 about the super predator. It was created in, the, uh, in the, the, the lab, the laboratory of Princeton University uh, by a, a sociologist named John DeIlio. And he was talking about me and people who look like me. We were these incorrigible uh, children drowning in criminality and violence and if politicians and law enforcement did not remove us from society that we would prey upon the public safety so in this narrative was echoed by the first lady hillary clinton by senator joe biden who's the president now so no surprise to me that in the State of the Union, he said, fund police, right? This is what he's been saying. So, um, but if you wanna, if you want to, if you wanna validate this claim of a super predator, right? Keep in mind, we poor black kids. We don't have access to coca fields for cocaine. We don't live in a city where it's legal to buy a gun. So you gotta, you have to facilitate the cocaine and the guns. For sure. For sure. So that's how it came to me. White boys in the middle of the night, not a made up story, real life story, selling us guns for crack cocaine. For sure, man. Um, mm. It's crazy to just hear it now, cause it's like, kind of. Cause before I was like beefing with guns, I always wanted a gun. Right. I couldn't get one. But it's like, once I started like getting into beefs with guns, it was like they was coming every night. For sure. So speaking on gun violence, us being from Washington D.C. Um, and you know, you us living in two different eras of gun violence in in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Like, how would you describe or compare, you know, gun violence then to mm -hmm. what it is now, from what you're hearing and seeing today? Initially, like, when I started to get into, like, an elder phase, um, I made a mistake of, like, being judgmental. 
you know, man, these young guys, these young niggas, these young, you know. Then I had to pull back and see, like, okay, we going to say that we was doing it for money and territory and drugs and and in hindsight, or now we looking now and be like, oh, they, they killing for nothing. When we did it, it was, but it's all a mental illness. It's all a mental illness, um, regardless how it plays out. It's, it's, a, it's a human sickness. And the weapon is just an instrument, right? The illness is in the heart. So in a healthy uh, home, neighborhood, community, city, nation, state, society, um, when people experience internal or external conflict, they, ab they are able to uh, articulate this either to themselves or to others to bring about some type of peaceful solution because they're not hurt. They're healthy. You know, but when you're dealing with a community who are already harmed and hurt, because I always tell people poverty in itself is violence in a capitalist society. We in America. We ain't got no capital. You hurting, right? So um, how I see it in my era versus the modern era today, I just see it's just like people hurting. And how, you know, the, the, they say, man, this generation because they listen to drill music, this generation because they trying to beef over money to be made selling crack cocaine, but at the end of the day, um, it's this, it's this uh, tangible instrument, which is a gun. It's not making nobody come to it. People are choosing to go to it because they don't feel like anything else in an effective way. And that's a mental condition. And I believe it's an illness. So, um, to, to bridge that gap to your incarceration, um, my first question would be, do you remember your last night as a free man? I remember that my last day. It was a day. I remember it. It was the last time I ever got drunk. I woke up that morning. I just said I was in a shelter house, like, like a pre-trial thing. And the, the night before, one of the guys that was locked up in there, he had fought one of the counselors that worked in there. So that happened in the night, whatever. So that morning I got up, it was a Tuesday after uh, Dr. King, they celebrated for the third Monday in January. So that Tuesday I got up, went to school, got me a little uh, beer, and I don't even drink beers, but I couldn't go get no liquor, no Hennessy at that time. So I got me a little beer and I'm waiting on the bus and I'm just drinking. Something just felt weird, right? So I'm catching the bus, got drunk, go to school, and they were they was having a seminar, this college in the library, and it was like, you know, recruiting students. So I'm like, okay, I know I ain't going to college, but let me just hear it out. Um, so I went in there and listened to the guy talk about, and I kind of like dozed off. And then like somebody tapped me on my shoulder, and I looked up, it was a security guy, he was like, you got your coat? Because, you know, the Eddie Biles back then, people getting killed for him. And I had so many Eddies because my friend, they used to rob people for him. And they had so many, they just gave me some. So he was the first thing he asked, like, you got your coat? And I'm like, yeah, but it's in this girl locker. I'm like, yeah. He said, come on. So keep in mind, I'm just waking up. Now you get up off the plane, you kind of a little drunk. So I go to walk in the hallway, and he open the door, is it? Light-skinned lady right there, she put the cuff on me. She's like, man, you under arrest? I'm like, under arrest? What? How old are you at this moment? I'm 16. Okay. I'm in high school. So when I look to the right, you got regular MPD here. You got detectives here. I'm like, what the? F in my mind, like, what the fuck is going on? Like, I don't know what the fuck they doing. And what school was you at? I'm at Phelps. Okay. Phelps Vocation School. So they, they take me out. Kind of popular in the school, so... The students, man, it's about to be a ride. They like, nah, he just coming home. Nah, y'all, he ain't do nothing. You know, it's that situation. They end up whipping out, 
backing them down. I'm talking about all the way to the car. You know, like, man, like, so when they took me, they drove me around the corner and they set me uh, by spin gun a couple of schools away and just set me in the back of the car. I was cuffed up and I'm thinking like, what the hell am I locked up for? I didn't know what I was locked up for. What the hell am I locked up for? Detectives? I ain't getting it. You know what I'm saying? So I remember looking at my, my partner, his apartment building up 21st Street was up there. And like a, a voice, you know, I ain't no hallucinating type of person, but I done had a few instances in life where I didn't heard a still voice. I know I ain't crazy. I might be a little crazy, but I don't hallucinate, right? right? And the still voice, I'm looking at my man apartment building, the still voice said, you're not going to see this for a long, I mean, dragged it long out, a long time. And I look. Because I'm like this, cuffed up. And I just remember, like, I just dropped my head. I was like, damn. But they said, man, but you going to see it again. And I just looked up, and I just remember, like, I just wanted to just look at everything, like, damn, I don't know how long I'm going to be in. But I'm like, I just start looking at everything. You know what I'm saying? And, and when they took me downtown to where you normally go get booked at, you know, you bust the right down uh, Central Cell Block. I bust the left. What's this? I take to Instead of busting the right, I'm busting. Nah, they taking me to homicide. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I ain't know where I'm going. So they take me to homicide. They handcuff me to the chair. They left me in there for like about seven hours, bro. Before they even came to say, in. I'm like, what? I'm like, you hungry? Like, nah, I ain't hungry. What's up? I'm trying to call my lawyer. And um, and then when they finally came in there and told me what I was locked up for, I laughed. Cause I'm like, oh, I ain't need to do this shit. I'm going home, right? I'm like, man, I ain't, I'm cool. You guys, no, nah, I ain't got nothing to say. I'm good. Take me, man. Take me down. Oak. Like, oh, nah, you ain't going to Oak Hill. You going over DC jail? You going over there with the big boys? You about to get life? I'm laughing, like, man, come on, man. Take me where you gonna take me, you know? So, and um, they took me down Oak Hill that night, and then the next morning. They crossed me over and then took me over to jail. And I remember it's a homie named Pretty B from Simple City. Uh, he was like, damn, you know, I was real small when I was 16. You know, he was like, damn, shorty, you going on the juvenile block? I'm like, yeah. He was like, man, just get you a knife, man. They're going to try to stab you, Slim. He said, man, just get you a knife, man, and just put that work in, Slim. I'm like, yeah, I already knew what's going on over there, right? So I'm like, all right, cool. And I just remember like a week later, he caught a, we allegedly caught a murder in the jail. You know what I'm saying? He went to trial and beat it, but you know, it's like, damn, man, that, that was my last experience, you know, in society, man, just like, and I never drank alcohol since then, never. So would that, would, in a sense, would that kind of like trick you, like does alcohol, just even thinking about it kind of trick you? Nah, day, for me it's like, the situation that I got locked up for, right, um, I had a part in, like, what led up to the dude getting killed. But I wasn't there when the dude got killed, though. Right. But I got locked up for, they saying I was there when the dude got killed. I wasn't. And I realized that me going to rob these guys inside of the, this, this drug house, it's just something I don't do. Right, but I'm playing this character called Face, right? And I was high off the boat, smoking PCP and weed, and I'm drinking. I'm I'm got the henny and the mower, I'm gone. It's the day after Christmas, 1996. And when I look back on it, I say, God damn. Decisions like recently I talked to somebody, people look at the price of everything. How much how much their food chain costs, right? How much your shoes cost? How much this house, how, what's the price? They want to know the price, but they don't know what things cost. So getting high and drunk, the price of the weed and the PCP is nothing compared to the cost of the bad decision that I made. You see what I'm saying? So... For me, it's like having 
spent so the consequences was crazy, bro. And I'm just never going to smoke and drink again. I don't know no other way to say it. What did they initially, like, what did they charge you with? Like, the moment they, mm -hmm. like, they sat down and told you what to charge you with, what did they say? Felony murder. Because, like, when you get indicted for murder, whether you the principal or the aid and the better, at the beginning it says they don't make a distinction. Right, you just say murder. You just murder, right? And if, and if you get convicted for first-degree murder, whether you pull the trigger or not, you gonna get the same time the person pulled it. Sometimes you get more. In my case, the person that was allegedly charged with being a shooter, they dismissed the case against him. He ain't snitched, make no statements or none of that. They took me to trial as his accomplice, convicted me, and just dropped the charges against him. So how many years did they initially give you? 40 to life and 20 to life. 16. 16. Yeah. I went to trial, came when I was 16, went to trial when I was 17, I got sentenced when I was 17, and went to Lorton when I was 17. So the moment, well, before we even get there, going over to D.C. jail, um, mm -hmm. you know, I always describe <clears throat> to people that, you know, was not from my area, you know, how our, our prison system is set up and right. how, you know, very small, you know, it is, mm -hmm. just before you leave the District of Columbia. Like, to be in D.C. jail in the 90s, what was that like um, when you first got in there? It's like if you live in a city that's 61 square miles and it has the highest per capita murder rate of any city in the country, and you take the people that's doing those, allegedly doing those murders, and you put them in an even more tighter space, space, right? Um, all it is is just people, man, that's just afraid and they don't ball up in the corner. <laughs> they fight. It's fight or flight. So what I've learned is that um, even that natural chemical release that we get from the fight or flight, it's not healthy. This one, the PTSD come in. Now you are producing that endorphin and you're not even in situations that's really um, that calls for the fight or the flight. And for me, it was like I knew before I got over there, man. You know, DC is a very uh, aggressive culture. It's violent. Um, I came up in the streets, and I knew that. Um, I just didn't. I remember guys would get calls home from prison. And you'd be like, like, what's up with such and such? Like, man, he getting pressed down, Lord. They do, they doing this. Oh, man, they, man, they took his shoes over to jail. I was like, man, that ain't gonna be me. You know, I ain't, you know, I, that just was my mentality. And I, I ain't think it made me no hell of a guy. At that time, I did, but now I can articulate it, you know, articulate it in a way that you know, a man just gotta protect this person and his property. And he has a right to do so. So you put me in that environment, guys getting raped, they getting stabbed, they getting robbed. I'm not going for it. Sure. Because my honor is everything. So that's the situation I went into, you know. And I, I went into it with that mentality and and that's just it was what it was. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And you know, you spending your time in that DC jail. How did the how did the whole HBO documentary come about? We were we were on the tier one day inside the jail and the juvenile tier. And um we thought they was white people, you know. Keep in mind I told you the um the limitations of growing up in a poor black city. Right. Beautiful thing, because we got we got our own thing, but it's it's limitations that come with it. So we see these people come in with these cameras. First, the two people come in, Mark Levin and Daphne Pinkerson. We don't know what a Jew is. We like, they white. And if they white, they the police. So we like, man, we ain't saying nothing. So we like, nah, nah, nah. 
So they're like, nah, we're not the police. You know, we just want to interview you guys and, you know. So then we like, well, we like, man, if we're going to talk to him, this on our tip, because if you see Andre Bruno joint, his approach was different. So on our tip, we was like, we just not going to talk about nothing criminal that can be used against us. We just going to talk about our conditions because they dogging us over here. We don't have no school. We, don't, we can't go outside. We can't go to the law lab. But like, to get the privilege to go outside and go to the law lab, we had to riot and burn the tear down, get gas masks and fight the police just to go to the law library to be able to fight our case, just to be able to go outside and get air. These people's not giving us no air, huh? So, you know, we wanted to talk about that. We had to wash our clothes in the toilet. So a lot of this stuff didn't never get in the edit, right. right? But this was our mentality on our tier, and that's how that happened, and that's how we agreed to talk to them, and um, and the documentary developed out of that. For sure. Yeah, nah, it's crazy because, man, you know, I've been watching that since I was, like, 22. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I was one day, you know, I just happened to be on YouTube, and I'm just like, man, DC documentary, mm -hmm. just to see what – documentaries they had for us that I could show people, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. about our city and culture. And that was the first joint that came up. So it's always crazy to, you know, just remember, you know, when I initially picked that up. Um, as you just mentioned, you know, from the documentary, uh, what happened to Andre? He's still in, um, I talked to his sister yesterday. She, um, he waiting to get back in court on the juvenile life issue that we got out on. Um, his lawyers was a little more cautious with his petition because um, he he experienced a lot of, you know, being locked down a lot, didn't get to get a GED, um, no vocational trades, and then, you know, all of that stuff he said in a documentary, you know, so, uh, so you know, but he waiting. He waiting to get out, wrote a letter for him. Um, and no, he just he just waiting, man. And hopefully he can he can um, be ready if he get the opportunity. Because I realized that um, everybody want to come home, but everybody's not prepared. And for some people, I would never advocate for keeping somebody in there. But um, some people get out and they end up um, just coming back. He was at D.C. jail, but they just, you know, the whole Trump people thing with the January the 6th. So they sent him back to the fair. I think he's in uh, Terry Hutt, in Indiana, okay. in the USP there. For sure, for sure. Um, I know that y'all 97, right? Mm hmm The riot. Um, what was that experience like? For me, I always was uncomfortable with being locked up. I never was the type of person that it just wasn't my thing. So when the old timers used to come down and cut our hair, um, they would encourage me, like, man, Shorty, you working on your case and da 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 da. So I was like, man, I need to get to this law library. What days we go? And they like, man, they don't be taking this. So I'm like, I ain't really tripping off going outside, though I like to go outside, but I need to get to this law library. So my thing. I'm instigating the ride, you know, because I'm like, I'm trying to get to the law library. Most people just want to get outside. So I had never been in a ride before. So, you know, we all put our juvenile minds together and we set the blankets on fire on the tear. Man, I ain't never experienced that smoke before, man. I literally felt like I was about to die. Like once that smoke, like if, if nobody never experienced a fire, you know, first you you burn the tear down, you, ah, you know, and they popping the doors one by one, coming in trying. But what they did was, the, the the officers, they let the fire burn a little bit. And man, you know, I'm like, oh, I can't breathe. I'm having a George Floyd situation. And the dude's like, man, put your head in the toilet, get low, get low, get. Man, I got low all the way on the floor. I'm. I am took my clothes, I'm, I'm like, man, I feel like my skin can't even, the smoke 
So I'm like, damn, man, I didn't even know that I literally almost damn near killed myself, but it was worth it. Because I knew that, man, if I, even even at that early stage of the, of the bit, I knew that, man, if I just lay down and accept that I'm not going to fight my case, I'm going to die in here. And I ain't trying to die in here from old age. So if I got to put my life on the line to get out, I can't think of anything better. I didn't put it on the line to get in here. Right. So I'm going to put it on the line to get out. 100%. And did y'all eventually end up getting Yeah, we got that law library. We got the law library. They, they start letting us go outside five days a week. And um, and then that's when the HBO uh, blow by production started coming in. So like first they they let up and then they was trying to squeeze it back, but then once they started coming in with the cameras, they kind of like had to start treating us a little bit better. For sure. First day in Lorton. First day in Lorton, man. I remember um, they came and got me that night. I wasn't even eighteen yet, and. Instead of taking me on a bus in the daytime, they came and got me at night. And because they, because of the, I guess because of the filming of the documentary, whatever, it wasn't even out yet. I guess they had me as high, high profile. So it was me and another guy named Dominique Gibson. And Dominique was from Lincoln Heights. He was locked up for killing the police. And they took us down together in a car. They snuck us down, Lord, in the car. And I remember it was nighttime and they was like, they took me behind the wall and they was like, all right, you in cell 17. And the tear, like, you know, behind the wall, it's like the tears, like something you see in Alcatraz or something. So they like cell 17 so, and they ain't cut the lights on. So I'm looking like, damn. You know, I ain't got no knife or nothing. I'm like, what the? They got me going, and I remember like walking down the tier, and you know, in prison, you're not supposed to look at nobody's cell. And Lord, and they got the bars, but I remember peeking, and I'm seeing these big ass men. These niggas was big. I'm like, damn. Yeah. You gotta keep in mind, I'm on the tier with kids. Right, right, right. Now I'm down here with some men. I'm like, damn. First thing I thought in the morning, like, damn, they gonna open the doors in the morning. I, that's the first time I kind of, because when you first go over the juvenile block, you got a little fear, but then you master that environment. Right. Now I'm like, damn, I ain't even got a knife. You know how it is and you in the streets, I ain't got a gun. Like, So that was my first experience. And um, I happened to be moved next door to a guy named Chuck Eastwood, who was on the juvenile block with me too. And I ended up being on the tier with a homie named Neldy, uh, Clyde, a couple of guys that I even knew from the streets or was on the juvenile block wood and um sent me down a, a knife in the morning. So I was I was cool, you know. But I'm like, man, Lorden behind the wall, the cells, they so small, man, like when I came down there in August, it was so hot. Right. Flying roaches. Man, I mean, it was so hot in the cell that the walls be crying and the toilets be crying. And you literally, like, got to just take all your clothes off at night and sleep on the, the metal just to be cool. Man. So that first day when they passed the night down to you, like, you know, what was your mentality then? Like, was it just a transfer from UC jail or was it like you had to adapt to a new... Yeah, man, because it's like... um. I saw two things happen within that first couple of weeks. The first thing was a guy, cause like behind the wall you lock down, you know, but you come out for outside rec and you come on the tier for 20 minutes, three days a week. So these guys was, one guy was set another guy deaf as we bar fight. And I couldn't see him cause they was down, but I heard him. He was like, all right. We'll see you when we come out. I ain't got no more rap. And that was it. He went sound and dude still. So when they hit the doors, all you heard was. Oh, 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 oh. 
And the thing was, I didn't see it, but they how it was narrated to me that the guy that was selling the wolf tickets had the knife. The guy, the other guy didn't. He took the knife from him. So now keep in mind, my mentality as a child at D.C. jail is like, man, get a knife. Now you're dealing with men. They're not afraid of knives. They, these men, they'll take your knife from you. You know, so, and then the second situation was, it was a guy that was on detail, man. Like he was like the orderly on the tea, served the ice or whatever, the food. And he never went outside with us. So one morning we went outside and we go outside in like a cage, small like this, and do pull ups and dips. I noticed he was coming outside and he came in the cage last. He got his cuffs off first and he just started stabbing a dude named Mike Davis, Vernon Davis, uncle. Right, Vernon Davis got an uncle named Mike Davis, was locked up for killing the police, was in Lord. I didn't know the night before, Mike Davis smacked Lil Bob through the bars. Lil Bob was on detail. I didn't know these guys, they had been in at this time about 20 years, 17, but they was men. Say like, this your man, y'all come in together the same, y'all mothers come down, Lord, but Mike Davis showing off, he's... Smack Lil Bob through the bars and Lil Bob like, oh, I'll see you tomorrow. He didn't didn't no arguing or nothing. Man, he stabbed that man about 50 times. And you imagine seeing a, a man, you know Vernon Davis and them big, their uncle big like that. But he cuffed behind his back and Bob just, I mean, he just picking them apart. And he trying to run and kick and falling on the ground. I'm like, damn. This brutality on a whole nother level down this joint, man. They trying to kill you. So that he, now he survived. He survived. That's crazy. That's crazy. And that, and that was how, how long in your, in your bit was that when you seen that? That was 98. So that about like a year and a half. Respect. 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 And um. That's what I learned was respect. For sure. You know, like. You learn to be very cautious on what you say and how you move because it's like as long as you respect someone and you carry yourself respectably, most people are going to respect respect. But now if you got things like you getting drugs, you got a nice girl coming to see you, nice sneakers and stuff like that, now you got to... The, the wolves. So they they might respect you, but they might they still try you. But more than likely, people know who you are, what you're capable of doing. They're not gonna try you. You know, they're gonna respect it. They envy you, but I learned like respect because like the a trigger word for anybody that did time is disrespect. Man, you disrespecting me. That's a kill word. So if you if didn't a whole whole home, I ain't intend that. I ain't how I disrespect you. Man, you do it. it wasn't my intent. And then from there on, if a guy be like, it wasn't your intent, but man, you disrespect. So you already know. You already know what's coming with it. You know? So like respect in those high security institutions is so is so important. You never want to disrespect nobody. For sure. What was, what was your first event of conflict that you had to resolve in prison? Man, shit. Like the first, like man, we. Like. I remember the first thing on the juvenile block. They had this northeast southeast thing. I'm from northeast. Um, couple of guys on the table from northeast. I never was into that, but they, and what happened was like on the juvenile block, I'm in this cell, this person, this cell, this cell. So they got uh, holes in the walls. So like, if you want to pass kites, they come to the back wall, you get it. So me, I'm passing kites in between these two guys from Northeast. I'm not even aware what's going on. So now when the stuff hit the head, um, this northeast southeast thing um a lot of the guys who were on the tier from northeast 
they they didn't want to step up to the plate. So a lot of them, they did what's called a check-in move, and they went up South 3, which was the site block. They saying, oh, no, nah, we went up there to get knives. All I know is, like, y'all gone. I'm from Northeast, right? I ain't backing down, though. So now I got into this Northeast, Southeast situation. And um, so what they did was the guy from Southeast who was kind of running the tip, he had got the, a dude from Southeast to uh, call my tray in the morning. So the dude was like, man, I got, I got, I got sell 45 tray. I'm like, shit, I got sell such and such tray. Right? So when the dude on detail, Fat Daddy from he bring me my tray, he's like, man, only reason I bought it because I had an extra. I'm like, nigga, if you went to board my tray, nigga, you was going to have to see. I ain't seeing no extra, none of that. Act like it ain't an extra, right? So when we come out, um, we was had to go to the law library. So my homie, Dirty, who out now, he from Southeast, and the dude from Southeast that's running the tears is his cousin. So Dirty like, nah, fuck you, Gloma. You going to see me. You trying to jump out there and be a flunk and jump out there with Face. You going to see me. So when we go to the law library, stay back. He was like, Face, go to the law library. I said, oh, I'm going to the law library. So Dirty stayed back in Fort Gloma. I went to the law library with about like five dudes from Southeast. And I remember they was like, man, you ain't scared? I'm like, no, nah, I ain't scared. I'm going to, I ain't scared of y'all. I don't, I don't see y'all. Like, I mean, I know what you capable of, but I'm not afraid of y'all, man. Like, I don't, I generally didn't have nothing to do with this beat, but now it is what it is. It is what it is. So, and they was like, man, yeah, man, your your, your co-defendant a bitch. He ain't even come out with you. And I was like, nah, he just wasn't feeling good. You know what I'm saying? I said, but I'm here. You know, so when we got back to the unit, uh, Dirty had Whoop Gloma or whatever, and the dude Rob from Southie, who was running the, the, the juvenile at that tier at that time, he was mad at Dirty. He's like, nigga, man, you supposed to be my cousin. And, and he was like, man, Dirty and a homie named Brucey, both from Southie. He's like, man, we rolling with face. And that kind of like diplomatically resolved it. You know, but Dirty fought, he fought Gloma. He fought him. So that was like my first situation. Like, damn, I'm so green. I'm passing these kites and not even knowing what's in these kites. It kind of made me with it. So, but it was like my first time using my mind, you know, because I didn't have my knife at that time. So I had to use my mind to kind of like finesse the situation. But if, if it had to come down to it, I wasn't checking in. That, nah, I wasn't going there. Any, any, any running in Lord? Nah, man. Like, I had one situation with an older homie, man, named Hurt Bay. Hurt Bay, he famous in the system for raping dudes, too. But, um, he, Hurt Bay, I think he was trying to try me because he's sick in his mind. But good dude, he just fucked up, though, right? Been in for a while, and he was letting me read his history books. And um, but they was hardback, so when they came do and did the shakedown, they couldn't find my knife. I had my knife so put up so good in the mattress, even with the metal detector, they couldn't find it. So the captain Perez he got mad and took the hardback books because people use those as vests. So I told her, "Baby, what happened?" Like, "No, nah, man, they ain't take my book, man. Like, I'm lying. Like, so I'm like, no, nah, they just said, no, nah, man.' Then I was like, "Hold up." I said, man, matter of fact, man, fuck you and your books. I'm going to get you to come out with me. That's just how I said I'm like, man, this nigga, like, he trying me, like, on some, for me to be scared and, like, because you got to keep in mind, he raped dudes. So I said, man, matter of fact, because keep in mind, this time, I'm like 19, I'm lifting the weights. I kind of got my weight up, and I got a immaculate blade. So I'm like, man, you know what? Man, fuck you and your book. So everybody on the team, like, damn. Man, fuck you and your book. I said, matter of fact, because he was in cell like 15. I was in one cell. I said, matter of fact, I'm going to get them to let us out together. So I went to the police. I said, look, when 15 wrecked the night, let me out with 15. 
So the police already know what that means. Like, you all right? Like, yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. We, we working on some legal shit. But the police know, like, oh, shit. Then, you all right? Like, I'm cool. So I came out, said it. You know, I guess he thought I was bullshit. So when they seen, like, normally when you wreck, like, 13, 14, come out together. When they got to 15, 16, they skipped them. He was like, my wreck. I was like, nah, you coming out with me. They was like, nah, you coming out with one sale. He was like, huh? They're like, yeah, you coming out with one with flowers. You all right with that? He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we came out, stepped straight to him. I had my, what's up? What's up? No, nah, no, nah, I ain't mean it like that, shorty. God damn, you took who? I'm not knowing what was happening was the old timers that was down Lawton, they was hearing about the young dudes killing. See, a lot of the older guys that got locked up in the 80s before crack, they was locked up for like rapes and snatching pocketbooks. So when they meeting our generation, keep in mind, they hearing about the murders. They've been locked up before crack, so they don't have an understanding with how it's going. So now when they meet me, I'm looking about this big, look like I'm 12. How much time you got, shorty? 40 to life, 20 to life. They're like, God damn. They wasn't getting that type of time. they like, man, what? they like, these young niggas. Cr-. So they was scared of us. So when they initially meet us, they're kind of tries with Lord dumb shit like that because they really like afraid of us but for real I was rational like man I ain't know nothing but just trying to get out I ain't going for nothing you know what I'm saying but I ain't I ain't in your way so how did y'all resolve it? I asked him what was up he was like nah he ain't want no you know, smoke I, I, cause I knew I couldn't play with him cause right. and he boxed right. cause we used to train together too he good with his hands he immaculate with his hands and he big but he don't like to push the knife. So, you know, as soon as the door pops, I step straight to him, what's up? What's up, what's up, what's, up? What's, what's going on about the book? He like, he look, oh, nah, shawty, you tripping. You did all, you know, and, and we just talked it out, like, nah, I ain't tripping off the book like that. I'm like, well, I thought you was trying me. Fuck. So. Respect. So, uh, Mr. Fowler. Mr. Fowler, man. Uh, I know reading your book, you know, Mr. Fowler, your words, you know, played a big part. Yeah. In, 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 in your, um... Samuel Fowler, man. Yeah, he, um, we would sometimes get each other mail. My last name, Flowers, his Fowler. And that's how we kind of got introduced to each other. A grumpy ass old man, um, miserable, intellectual giant, jailhouse lawyer, um, and he, we connected through the mail thing like that. And then he saw that I was taking an interest in studying the law. So he started helping me with that with my case. And he would hear me argue with the sergeant, you know, because the sergeant didn't like me when it come time for prayer. I'd be like, Allah, walk by Allah. And the sergeant, like, you making that noise in the morning? I'm like, I kill you. What you tell me I'm making, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a fanatic at that time. So... And Mr. Fowler, he told me, he was like, man, don't get caught up, man. And, you know, you got your religion, but people are not fighting wars about religion. They fighting wars about resources. He said, man, once you understand, he said, man, just follow the money. Just follow the money. He said, listen, boy. You know, they need old time to tell you, listen, boy. You follow the goddamn money. You stop reading that goddamn sports page and all that dumb shit. Politics, nothing. Money. Money. You got money coming. You turn 18. You power turn that money over to your mother. You tell your mother to put some of that money in gold. And he said, China will run the world economically within the next 10 years. Keep in mind, China's nothing back then. This the 90s. I said, China? Only thing I'm thinking is rice. He said, steel, boy. They got steel. They manufactured. Flew above my head. I know about the gold. But I'm, I ain't, you know. And uh, I powered attorney the money over to my mother, but she didn't get the gold. You know, she didn't get the gold. So we know where the prices of gold at now. 
versus back then. Back then it was like like hundred some hundred fifty dollars a troy ounce. Now it was like what like fifteen hundred, sixteen. Whatever happened to him? I don't know. He was old though. I know he did. If he not, it'd be a miracle. I know in your book also, man, you know, you stated when you was, you know, facing that forward of life and then picked up that additional murder time. Mm -hmm. And you say you felt like you was at your lowest. Yeah. What, did, what was that? What was, what was your mind state and emotion like at that point? For me, you know, the situation was the guy, he had a knife. I had a knife and I stabbed him first. And when the lieutenant came to me, he was like, man, he died. I'm like, damn. Because, like, first we on the tears, cool, everybody think it's funny. But then I saw, like, D.C. police coming in. I'm like, Shh, what the fuck? I seen a whole lot of niggas get stabbed. I ain't never seen the, the street police come in. So when they took me to the hole, and it was like he died, I'm like, damn, this nigga died. And he told before, this nigga made a whole statement on me. And he lied and... Put another dude from Congress Park on there that wasn't even... This dude, man, was on the tear for like two days. This man had made a dying declaration that my co-defendant and this dude, Barracuda, from Congress Park held him down as I stabbed him. So I'm more worried about Barracuda snitching because I don't know him, right? So, and I just remember like, damn. Like, man... If I don't beat this joint, like, I always felt I can get out on my case because I knew I was innocent. But I'm like, this joint right here, I'm kind of, like, guilty and in jail. And But he lived. They brought him back to life. And he was trying to press charges and all that, but he I don't, he had a change of heart. But um, I just knew at that point right there I had to change. I didn't change at that point, but I knew at that point, man, if I keep plan being face I'm gonna be one of these old timers that you see they got two three four bodies and never going home fucking boys and snorting dope and that's gonna be me and I I knew that 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 wasn't for me for sure for sure um out of all the you know just the you know your experiences in incarceration what 22 years mm-hmm out of all the facilities you've been to, which one had the most, the biggest impact on you? Lewisburg. Lewisburg is where I'm, um, I was there from 2002 to 2008. I met my, one of my greatest mentors, a man who I call my dad, uh, Michael Norwood, Minka, um, the best jailhouse lawyer in America. He gave me the game. You know, like I already was researching the law, but he taught me how to, litigate how to write effective motions and I gave my first life sentence back with him I got the the uh the 40 down to 30 to life um he showed me how to start my own publishing company so once I got got did that I kind of like transitioned from being face to being like this CEO now I met one of my mentors to this day Ernest Smith it's like where I became, because I went to Lewisburg, I was 21. I left, I was 28. So your brain started developing, they say 25 as a man. So I kind of like went through that wild young phase and right, transition from face to like this author, CEO, publisher, using my books and curriculum at Bucknell University. And to where though, like I look at the street part, like, man, that was anything. You know, like that was, right. yeah. I know how to compartmentalize my violence now, my anger, and you know, and nothing wrong to protect yourself. But outside of that, like, just doing it to, just to get a rap is senseless. 100%. Like literally, like scentless, like not sent, just scentless, but like it don't make money. Twenty-two years incarceration. Walk us through the moments. How did how did you even get close to, you know, the whole situation with you being free, getting free? Um. In two thousand four, I became aware of a case called Roper versus Simmons, 
it was being um, argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. It was about could a juvenile under the age of 18 get the death penalty? And I was like researching this issue even before the decision came in 2005, January. But I'm like, oh, man, they saying you, you can't get married, you can't vote, you can't serve in the military, you can't... Like, damn, this makes sense. I felt it, like, oh, this is how I'm going to get home. And people, I was telling dudes, and, and they like, man, that's a death penalty case. I was like, you don't see the picture, bro. It's the death penalty now, but look at the language. They making the delineation, the distinction between a child and they using neuroscientific brain stuff, right? So I started writing like professors that was dealing with neuroscience. And I mean, like, so that was 2005. That came out. 2010 was uh, Graham versus Florida that dealt with if a juvenile doesn't intend to kill, they can't get life, right? Then in 2012 was Miller versus Alabama that said that even if a child intends to kill, they can't just automatically be sentenced to life. They got to at least have some type of evaluation, right? Only in rare circumstances. So I'm like, oh, shit, keep in mind, I'm not even locked up for killing nobody. I'm just locked up for, they saying, being with somebody that killed somebody. And then in 2016, they had a case called Montgomery versus Louisiana. And they said that the law about juveniles not being able to get life was retro. It had to be applied retroactive. Meaning that if you came in before the Miller case in 2012, that it applied to you. So then right there, I had got an email from, I can't remember the lady name, but she was from the DC uh, Public Defender Service. And she was like, DC is about to have a public hearing on a new law that if you do 20 years, keep in mind it's 2016. I come in 97, I'm right there on my 20. So it's like, if you do 20 years, um, you could come back and ask to be resentenced and released. She said, but the only thing is, the law, the way it's written now, it won't be applied retroactive, meaning it will only apply to people who come in from 2016 on up. So she said, I think, man, if you can get somebody to go to the hearing and testify for you, that we, we can get it done retroactively. So when she told me that, keep in mind, I've been, I've been on this issue since 2004. I came down here to USP Atlanta to get the cell phone. I was in FCI in New Jersey living comfortably as far as prison. They had the cell phones in Atlanta. I switched my address. My grandmother address was down here. I came to USP Atlanta just to get the phone to fight my case on the phone so I can have access to the lawyers all over the world. So I knew it was coming from when I had the cell phone in Atlanta. So, um, so I had a lady from an organization named Allison Horn. Her name Allison Horn. At that time, she was working for Free Minds organization that works with juveniles that um, get charged as adults. I wrote my test first. I emailed all the city councilmen and the mayor. That's the first thing I did. Emailed all of them. Three councilwomen wrote back. Elisa Silverman, Brianna Dow and Murray Chait. Nobody else wrote back. No black people, no no black council members wrote back. Um, even though the law was written by a black council member, Kenyon McDuffie, who's now running for attorney general in D.C. They wrote back and they was like, hold up. You mean to tell me that it's people in there from the 80s and 90s? It's Jew they couldn't even fathom it because a lot of them migrated to D.C. later on. So they like, hold. Oh, so you mean to tell me you can't get out until you... They couldn't find it. They said, oh, we're going to look into it. So the lady Allison read my testimony at the public hearing, and um, and I got a lot of other people to go down there and speak. So in two, November 2016, they passed the law. The mayor signed off on it in December. And it was enacted in April 4th, 2017. 
So from that point, they had to get us lawyers, and I got sent to California. So I uh, finally got my lawyers, and I came back in 2018 to the jail, and then I got out on March 19th. And um, I had the opportunity to meet the counsel before I got out, and they told me, like, we made this law because of you. Like, we learned about you, what you was doing, your story. Like, you was the reason, like, we made this law, you know, like, because of you. And they wanted me to, they was they was coming up with an amendment to the law. Instead of it applying to people under the age of 18, they wanted to extend it. Like, anybody who committed a crime under the age of 25. So they was like, man, we want you to speak at the hearing, but being as though that you in here at D.C. jail, we want to hold the hearing here. This is going to be the first city council hearing at D.C. jail, right, so that you could speak. So I did that. They came over there. We filmed that. And then they wrote my judge and told my judge, man, like, to let me out early so I can speak at the hearing at the city council in society. So that's how I got out like a month early. My judge let me out. I got out like on March 21st, that was on a Thursday. That Tuesday I went to the city council and, and spoke. And then that law, we got that law passed 2020 or 21, one of these years. So it's out. So guys getting out now on that, that came in under the age of 25. It's crazy, bro. Yeah. It's like Yeah. Um, the moment you find out you were being released. Yeah. Take us through that moment. I went to court March fifteenth. Uh, my judge said I was going to be released. She was going to extend it for the month. She said, well, "Come back in April, I'll release you." But the city council was like, "Nah, we need him out next week." So she said, "All right, well, I'll release you next week." So that six days. Man, like, I couldn't sleep, bro. Like, I literally, because so much of my time in prison, you know, I was a guy that was reading the Wall Street Journal every day. And I knew what I was going to do when I, when I had my cell phone in Atlanta, I was telling like, man, I'm going to be rich when I get out. Like, I know this money thing now. I know I just need to get out and get to that cell phone, that laptop, that iPad, that everything that Wallow be saying. I'm like, damn, man, Wallow was thinking the same because I knew it. I'm like, man, I got talent. I got ideas. I got ambition out of this world and drive. Like when y'all sleep, I'm going to be up. When y'all going to go to the strip club, I ain't going. I'm on it. I ain't smoking, drinking, none of that. I don't care about the girls, nothing. I'm coming out to run up a bag and build a legacy and then – a foundation for other people to run up the bag, right? So, and once I figured out that about myself, prison was hard. So, you know, like, I knew what I was coming out to do. So now that last six days, like, oh, man, I literally, bro, like, you know how people exaggerate? Like, I couldn't sleep no longer than 10 minutes for six days. I would be like, man, I'm tired, man. I, ain't, I lay down. And I get up, felt like I was asleep for eight hours. I look at my little radio, man, I was asleep for five minutes. I couldn't sleep. So, like, get, get, getting up to that day, went to court that morning on the 21st. Judge ordered me to be released. Went back to the jail, had the process out, waiting on that. My lawyers had to come in. While I'm, it was a hold up about the marshal's signature and, so I ended up getting out like at 7 p.m. And I just remember like just wanting to leave. You know, like I ain't had no rap, like, cause they was filming it and I'm like, man, let's just get off this property, man. Like, I don't even like wanna be here. And it was raining and I went to my mother house and I had my phone. I had my phone, I had a laptop, and I was like, man, I'm going to work. That's all I remember. Ate my mother food, and that shit was nasty. I was surprised. Like, damn, my mother used to cook. cook. She getting old. She can't put seasoning in the food no more. 
I looked at my mother's house, like, damn, man, we moved from the apartment here. This was like a big house. But being in prison, looking at all those architectural digests and four, like, damn, this joint's small. You know what I'm saying? Like, my grandfather, old, Kane. That's that was the beginning of feeling. Prison made me numb. Being out here is way more traumatic than being in prison to me. That's tough. I know I know in the documentary I remember your mother coming to visit you. Yeah. Right. Over that time, like just being back with your mother in the free world, like, you know, like how do you think she just feel? My mother is the type of person, man, I never seen her cry but one time in my life. And I told her two times, my great-grandmother's funeral, and one time I told her I hate her. So my mother, like, she Joe Cool. She ain't saying that. You ain't going to get all that out of her. Oh, mom, I'm so proud you home. I'm so happy. She's like, Lane, uh, hand me that can of soup, right? Lane, do it. I'm like, damn, all that time I had her doing this and this and that when I was in prison with the books and all that, boy, she wearing my ass out now. I mean, she might be sitting right there and be like, lean, hand me this cup right here. But my wife was like, nah, she's just happy to have you home. That's her way of expressing her love, like, because you so busy, you doing it. So when she gets you around, she just wants you, she's just happy to have that luxury, you know. But for me, like, Man, my mother, like, man, like, it's hard, man, for real, bro. It's like made me tear up, man, talking to you, talking to you about my mother, man, because you lost your mother, bro. Yeah. And seeing, like, what Kanye going through, bro, like, that documentary, man, like, my mother, bro. It's really a blessing. Man, my mother, she never gave up on me, bruh. Like, the beautiful thing, man, about being Harleen is that I can feel, bruh. Like, I went so long without feeling, you know, like, and like, man, having my daughter, bro, seeing my daughter look just like my mother, and it just like made me, cause you never get to see your mother as a baby. So I'm looking at my daughter, she she bossed me around just like my mother, and I'm like, damn. Not only because when you watch the documentary in the video, I'm like, if I do 30 years, my mother gonna die. You know, like, and if I and if I come home, I'm not gonna be able to have no kids. So I might as well just stay in here. That was my thought. That's face, right? So to be out, man, and see that my mother's still alive and my mother seen me have a child, not just a child, a girl that looked just like her, man. It's, it's so powerful. And now that when I, when I meet and talk to people who lost their mothers, man, it's like, shh. I remember, man, on the Lil Boosie song, he was like, shh. He was like, man, if I was Kanye, I'd still be hurt. You know what I'm saying? Like, and me talking to the brother D, talking to you, it's like, damn. When I got to that point where I was talking about my mom, I'm like, damn. I feel like survivor's guilt talking to y'all, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, shh. Sure. Man, when Kanye say that on that, that Jesus Lord, man, that woman rode with me like a holly, shh. Man. Man, that woman rode with me like a Harley, bruh. I was locked up in California, 
Atlanta, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, D.C., Oklahoma. Man, that woman, shh. Man, come on. With, uh, your friend, man, uh, Mama Lou. Yeah. Um, how did Kim Kardashian get involved with his situation? So speaking of Kanye. Yeah. Um. When we was Mama Lou and I, we came back to court. Um. The D.C. Department of Corrections was just starting to have the Georgetown classes there. So Mark Howard, our professor, um, friend family now he um he also has a program called uh making of an exoneree we help people um who have wrongly convicted to get out so i got out and then when i got out kim wanted she wanted to do a documentary so she her people contacted mark howard and they was looking for stories so she was interested in mama lou's story and um, and then when she found out about me and Kareem, because Kareem is Mom Lou co-defendant on another case, Mom Lou my co-defendant on my case, and what we was doing on the outside, she was like, "Damn, I want to incorporate them into it." So that's how we went. You know, we set it up. She filmed me doing some poetry at my studio, and um, and she filmed Kareem, and then uh. We went over to jail to go see Mama Lou. So that part in the documentary, like where I'm talking, me, Kim Kareem there, and she went and talked to Mama Lou, man. She, you know, she fell in love with the story. And I respect her because like the she was cool when she just was doing the drug cases. The media was all right. And then the little girl from Tennessee, they was like, well, she killed her pimp, you know. But Mama Lou like, nah, I just kill people. I'm I'm guilty. You know? And she stood in front of that and she took a lot of flat. But she was like, man, the man was a kid. Like his father got killed when he was six and and she stood on it, man. And um she told me some things. What I respect about people is when they do what they say. And she told me, she was like, man, Harleen, she was like, this not a fad for me. She was like, man, my keeping up with the Kardashians, all that's about to be dead. This is my life. This is what I'm passionate about. And to see her stand on that, um, you know, it's it's a honorable thing. You know what I'm saying? She's she's very passionate about it. And, you know, she introduced me to Kanye. And I didn't think that we would be performing at the Sunday service. That that you know, cause I was, I I was doing a performance in Detroit, and I flew back, and we met Slim and talked to him and real down to earth conversation, you know, for a long time, and then went out Sunday service, performed, went to this Lord Jesus Jesus is King, private listening session at George Washington, met his family, met her family, the kids, so that's how that came about through Mark Howard, you know, but um, it was it was. It was interesting to see somebody, you know, um, that the world, um, even though it's this reality show, it's just that part of Kim. But to get a chance to meet Kim, not Kim Kardashian, but Kim. And um, it was cool, and I respect her. For sure, man. For sure. Man, 2022, so crazy. Yeah. Um, Two years. You you are today, father, husband, father. You know, artist, scholar. Um, what's next for you? Right now, um, today is like March 9th. So on the twenty first, it'd be my third, three year anniversary of being home. So now what we doing with the advocacy and. The entrepreneurship we 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 putting in the fashion and design. Um so on March twenty first, I'm gonna be dropping twenty three sneakers. Cause I found out I thought it was twenty two years, but when you go from ninety seven to two thousand nineteen, 
2019 was the 23rd year. So I designed 23 sneakers, um, and I designed them for each year of what I was going through. And um, and now to be released on, on March 21st, and it's only one sneaker for each year. So keeping in line, like, you know, with me being this fine artist, painter, um, not one to mass produce the fashion I design, but make everything limited. So more than just fashion, it's also like a collectible and an increase in value. So, um, so yeah, I just, um, I, because like people, when they want you to be an activist, they think you, they got a one way. You know, you got to have a Black Lives Matter sign and go to the rallies. That don't work for me. Um, what works for me is entrepreneurship, storytelling, uh, art, creativity, fashion, design, architecture. It's so many different ways that um, that I'm going to, you know, use my my intelligence and my creativity um, to push for black excellence. You know, um, so that's that's the thing, man. We got the HBO documentary. We filming that. Um, I think that's going to get released either later this year or early next year. It's like the 25th anniversary to the Thug Life in D.C. And um, I got the art book coming out with my art gallery. So it'll be like one of them big art fancy books. I got the solo exhibit at Art Basel, Miami this year in December. The fashion line keep going. And um, all in all, you know, just um, I'm looking forward to the new documentary. I think it's. I think it's. it's a, something need to be seen. You know. Um, yeah. And um, man, you know, I always close with this question, bro. Mm-hmm. Um, if you had the power to go back in time and change anything that happened in your life, if you if you want to, mm-hmm. what would it be? First, I wouldn't. But if I was compelled to. Um, I would I would give myself a very detailed conversation about the trauma of being black and successful. That's I wasn't prepared for that. Um and it's been it's been more difficult for me than prison was because in prison you really just got to look out for yourself and when you come from a people who've been as racially identified as black in a nation that has had laws and policies in place to keep us economically suppressed redlining, restrictive covenants, you know, all these different federal housing administration laws that didn't let us buy houses in the suburbs and so forth and so on. And then now you make it successfully, financially. So, and you come from poverty and you come from prison. Poverty and prison both create desperation. You poor, you desperate to get money. You in prison, you desperate to get out, and I'm connected to both. So it's like I wasn't prepared to mentally deal with everybody enveloping me with their desperation. The guys in prison, hey man, you think you can get Kim to get me out? You see what I'm saying? You think you can help me get publicity to get out? Constantly, right? Hey, man, um, I ain't been on the trucks lately, man. You think I could hold something to get my IRS check? Constantly. Family, people who never was even there for you. Constantly begging. The envy, the jealousy. Now you a lick. You know, now you, you got to be aware, like, damn, I'm a lick. So, you know, like, and these people that you love, you doing stuff for them. 
you love your people. You know what I'm saying? But like, I kind of envy that part of white privilege. Like when I'm hanging out with these billionaires and millionaires that buy the artwork, they preparing for corporate takeovers or, you know, we can't even be comfortably successfully. Now we, we got to worry about somebody trying to snatch us, come in the house. You know what I'm saying? Like, damn, I left the streets with it. I still got to have an AR. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's traumatic, man. Like, I did all of this to chill. You know what I'm saying? Can't you can't even chill. So it's like, I wasn't prepared for that. I wasn't prepared for that. And it's, it's, it's traumatic. I'm going to get therapy and to figure out, you know, the, 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 how to navigate through these pockets of desperation. Because I'm still connected to the poverty. I'm still connected to prison. You know what I'm saying? How do I, how do I, as a rational, reasonable human being, how do I communicate with people that I know that's communicating out of desperation? Been poor, been in prison. They don't have reasonable expectations. They just desperately want you to help them. Even if it bring you down with them, it's just a desperation. So if I could change anything, it definitely, I would have definitely prepared more for the trauma of being black and successful. 